We're here with Brian James Gage. <laughs> Is it, are we starting? Yeah, we can. It's sweet. Brian. Do you have like a dope intro for me or something? I don't, man. Oh, shit. But I can introduce you like this. Okay. Brian yep. James Gage. That's me. The Nosferatu Conspiracy. Book one, The Sleepwalker. There's going to be a book two. Oh, hell yeah, there's going to be a book two. Dude, I honestly should have read this before we started <laughs> all of this. You know, that's one of the things that I think is really funny about uh, being an author is that this is in many ways a lost art, right? There are people that are rabid readers, but by and large in society, people don't give a shit about you. It's like you're the white trash of fame. Like I'm, I might as well just be hosting boat shows at this point in time. You know what I'm saying? So I don't expect people that I know or friends of mine to actually read anything I write. That's horseshit though, man. Because <laughs> then what's the point of doing anything at that point, right? Like you have to start from somewhere. Well, I mean, you know, this is my fifth book. It's my first novel, but um, the uh, I've published four other books. I probably, let's just put it this way. If I, if I used to have whatever semblance of a fan base I had back in, you know, 2000 through 2005 when I was active, those people have long forgotten about me, right? So I'm, st I'm sort of starting over with this new thing, uh, which is why I'm seeing kind people like you to get the message out. So thanks for having me on, uh, is it, what is it, the, the Nova Studios show? What are you calling this? The Nova Lab Chronicles. The Nova Lab Chronicles, yeah. sweet, dude. Yeah, we're chronicling our weird new thing. All right, I I'm happy to be a part of that. Oh, we're happy to have you on. So, so what led to this? I'm curious. Like, what was your inspiration? Well, that back in the day, well, I was, that was going to be my, you know, fifth book. Uh, so I've been, I was published traditionally um, for three satire books and one children's book, right? And the, the children's book and the last satire book, uh, which was called Burn Christmas Burn, and it was about Santa's elves who are tired of working in his sweatshop. So they, <laughs> they overthrow Christmas and escape his um, sweatshop by uh, wrapping themselves in the presents so when people get presents on Christmas morning and they open them, they're attacked by elves. What the hell, man? Yeah, that's... <laughs> that wasn't the children's one, right? That was the satire? I mean, well, you know, I used to get, not hate mail, hate mail, but people would write me <laughs> pissed off. Like, hey, I bought this for my kid and this isn't for kids. Rip. Like, I, it's your kid. It's not my problem, man. But, Did you have a, like a rating on there? Like rated M for? No, but uh, the child, the saddest little robot was the children's book. But through that, people expected to meet expected me to do more of the same, mm. right? So when I wrote this book, which is extraordinarily graphic and gruesome, um, I had three separate agents who wanted to work with me that after reading that quit speaking to me entirely, like just wouldn't even return my phone calls or anything. And oh, I was- this bad then. Uh, well, I was told that it would never be published due to, uh, it's like, you need to tone down some of this gruesome stuff. Like uh, there's a death cult in the book operating and they're trying to essentially, the plot of the book is that there's writings by left over by Vlad Dracula, Vlad the Impaler, and uh, how he became a vampire. So there's it's, there's this thing called the Holy Bible of the Living vam Vampiric Witch, and you'll see quotes of it through as the book, like it opens up. So uh, that's a that's a real thing though. Well, that's the the whole point of this book is supposedly that uh, history is a lie, the truth will be exposed. So I'm positioning it fictionally as like a War of the Worlds style. There's what you've heard in history, and then this is the reality of what you're facing. Got right? it. Okay. So anyway, the uh, Vlad the Impaler, it starts out with the quote here at the beginning. Uh, Behold, eternal night rises with the blood of men in its cusp. Vlad Dracula, B Book of Visions 4-9, and then the Holy Bible of the Living Vampiric Witch, right? So it looks, so you you get Bible quotes from Vlad the Impaler as you go through this. And then the narrative unfolds. So the narrative unfolds to discovering that um, there is a death cult operating um, right around the turn of the century that's trying to use v Vlad the Impaler's teachings for uh, the aristocracy, because what he preaches is that vampires are the rightful might and order of humanity, and vampires should be served by humanity as their bloodstock. And the only way that you can do that is by um, reincarnating these higher level vampires called the Nosferatu, right? Mm -hmm. So I've took, I took like the Max Shrek Nosferatu thing and morphed it into this much more dangerous creature. And the way that they're created is there's this, um, 
there's this lock in the middle of the Carpathian Mountains, which Vlad the Impaler discovered, right? And on the lock, there's this haunted blackwood forest where these giant, this, this is actually real cryptozoology shit. They're called Desmodus Draculae, and they're man-sized vampire bats, right? So people say That's they- fucking terrifying, it is, by the yeah. way. People say they exist in the real world, but you know it's the same as saying the Loch Ness. But, but there's people who hunt for these in real, you'll find real people today who will swear to you that these man-sized vampire bats exist. So in my book, they exist. And so the way that what Vlad the Impaler discovered through like, you know, communing with darkness was that if he, uh, he was bitten by these bats and then his wife was bitten by these bats. So they turned into vampires, right? They're now the prime vampires whose bloods are linked to these beasts. They then have uh, a human formed child. And now the bats have a human blood link to this realm. And then they transform into these ver ver uh, ferocious Nosferatu. Now they can spread their vampirism and they have this army of darkness over them that can like swoop over all of mankind and just devour everybody. Because these Nosferatu need to consume their own weight and blood every night. So they just mow through towns and cities and all this other stuff. Where was your headspace at when you were coming up with this map? You know, the funny thing is, man, when I was looking at this narrative, the next book, which is called The Sommelier, which uh, is like a- Like a wine cat. Like a wine yeah. dude, right? Uh, or dudette. Taster. Um, Blood taste. This next book is su super out there. I, have you ever read Lair of the White Worm by Bram Stoker? No. Okay. I read it when I was like 17 or 18, and I don't think that I was prepared for such. It's a really – he was clearly on drugs when he wrote it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's so essentially there's – the plot is there's this – oh, God. How do I describe it? It's been so long. Uh, there's a worm, a giant mean white mean – can come up with a better word than that, but there's a giant worm that lives under this house in rural England. W Y R M. W O R M. Worm. Like an actual. Like a worm. A, worm. a white okay. worm. Uh, and so then you know people are fed to the white worm. It's 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 an allegory for something, I'm sure. But um, anyway, that 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 was a big inspiration for the next uh, series in this book. But what I was, I don't know, man. I was I wrote this short poem for uh, an anthology about vampires. And I've always been obsessed with vampires. I, I enjoy vampire mythology. And uh, I've also, for some reason or another, have always been obsessed with Imperial Russia. Like, I'm into Fabergé eggs. That's how deep I go. Like, if you would be like, yo, this weekend at LACMA, they're having a Fabergé egg exhibit. I'm like, I'm all about it. <laughs> I, it's, so have like, you ever seen a Fabergé egg? Of course. I you know, my family's Armenian, man. We've, we've, we've seen all sorts of crazy <laughs> so Russian you, stuff. You probably dude. have like imitation Fabergé eggs. I'm sure my grandma had stuff oh, like gonna, that, dude. I'm gonna yeah. Have your grandma. I, was, I mean, not anymore, uh, but sorry. yeah. Rest in peace, my friend. Sorry. Love you, grandma. Amen. Um, but uh, so, and Rasputin, I think, is a total badass. As yeah, you that's know, like, who, 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 what historical figure would you have dinner with? I always name Rasputin as the dude. I was gonna go on and ask you that. Like, would you go like as Halloween? Rasputin type level. Is that the could, level you've gotten you to? You could do it. You got the beard, you man. You could buy one. Yeah, you, if you're going Rasputin, you got to do it all natural. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? To the I, I grow like uh, a weird guy. Like I don't have any hair that grows right here. It's perfectly like 14 year old kid. So I grow. I would grow like an artist's beard. I, I can't. I can't do the man beard yet. It's weird. It's okay, dude. It's not gonna. I'm mean, at 47. You got to realize my beard dreams are done. I mean, I, I think there's always uh, like it's a grass is greener on the other side kind of argument because you don't realize the level of pain that I go through. Yeah. To even it's keep horrible. it, like if you were gonna keep this, it's daily. If I wanted to keep it, yeah, yeah. it'd be daily, man. Yeah. It's awful. Um. So, anyway. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. No, no, cut me off all day. Rasputin, uh, you gotta Fabergé keep, eggs. I'll warn you right now. Keep me in check because I will legitimately overtalk you and run your ear off on that. <laughs> it's fine, man. You're, you're here to talk about I'm your a, stuff, dude. So I'm a chatty fellow. <laughs> yeah. All right. So then, fine. Let's let's move on to something else. I'm curious about this. Russia, uh, vampires. Yes. What was up with that video? Because I'm I want to showcase oh, that too. I saw those trailers. Those were dope. You want to talk? Those about, were dope. I appreciate that because uh, I've always had a. a uh, a secret inkling to uh, my real, uh, I, I consider this to be sort of cinematic fiction because I think uh, because I was so brainwashed growing up on HBO Cinemax and all that. I mean, I've seen every bad horror film you could imagine. Mm. Um, I was glued to the television from the time I was probably six until 17 or 18. Funny enough, I don't really watch television at all any longer. Um, but being involved within cinema, 
or, or movie production is something that I've always kind of dreamed of doing, but I also sort of like hate people a lot. So I can't, I don't play well with others and I see what would it take all of the organization and the, this actor's acting like a jerk. This actor yeah. doesn't show up. This producer wants this. I would, I would go nuts under a circumstance. You like need that. to have that teamwork. Who knows? I mean, if I have the right crew, I can get anything done. I mean, we've worked together in the mm-hmm. past, so, you know, um, and, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a good uh, collaborator if and when things are moving in my direction. But if somebody has a if somebody has a counter idea that I'm not into, I, I get a little. So you got to be producer, director, editor. See, then I see. I don't even like saying that kind of stuff because then it just sounds like some LA bullshit. You might end up at a what is it? Can I, I really, Can Film Festival? The reality of me ever being at Can Film Festival is um, you might as well be like I, you might be on the moon. Because I think I have a better chance of going to the moon. Come on. Because I like to sit in my room and work on my stories. That's where I'm at. Mm. But so funny enough, uh, I've always had, like, I stand, I'm obsessed with Stanley Kubrick. Okay. Uh, to the point of when I structure scenes in my book, I always try to think of, like, okay, how would Kubrick have set this up? Like, where would the camera angle be? You know, um, generally with Kubrick, it would be way the fuck out here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, He's a huge influence of mine in um, thematically and uh, what I would consider is what I'm going for as a visual aesthetic within the book. Um, so when it came down to, I took a break. So the, the agents that I was working with on this book were like, and I don't begrudge them for turning it down because they were essentially like, oh, we don't know who we work. There's no editors we know that would pick this up. It's you got to change because, like for example, in the book, the death cult, there's a fertility ritual where they're trying to give birth to the next iteration of this blood child, is what they call it, that will respawn these Nosferatu. And it's not happening. That there's a re- Rasputin got involved and kind of messed it all up. It's I don't want to give too much away. No, don't, don't. Uh, anyway, so essentially, long story short, is he was working with this thing called the Black Hundred, which originally, historically, was an anti-Semitic conservative movement movement who was loyal to the Tsarist regime right before the Bolshevik re- Revolution. Um, so I took those guys and made them the, this evil death cult in the book, and they're also they also worship Vlad the Impaler. They're trying to get this done. So they try to do this situation whereby the bats bit Alexandria, the future czarista of right, Russia. Yeah. And then um, Nicholas's brother was originally supposed to be the other one. And then the German aristocracy and the Russian aristocracy were going to take over the world with vampires. Right. Rasputin steps in and kills this guy and inserts himself into the process. So now it's the czarista of Russia and this, you know, Russian mystic are the new vampires. And something happens in the book where they're separated. So he doesn't get to mate with her to create this child that could bring back the Nosferatu. So it's stuck in limbo. She gets rescued, planted in St. Petersburg, falls in love with the czar, marries, has a son who's half vampire, right? So the kid, the the bats are stuck in limbo because the, their supposed blood child, although of human yeah, yeah, form, yeah, yeah. has human blood in them. The only way they can correct this process if he murders and drinks the blood of his human father to destroy that blood link, and then the Nosferatu can transform. So Rasputin's job, essentially, in this book is seducing this young child to murder his father, right? It's super dark. Let me, let me ask you a question. Huh. Have you ever played Vampire the Masquerade? I have not. Are you familiar with it at all? I don't know what that is. Dude, that shit would be right up your alley. All right, I'm into it. Uh, I'll I'll show you. It's a a tabletop role-playing game. I don't do well with board games. It's not a board game. Are you familiar with Dungeons & Dragons? I am. Okay, so this is Dungeons & Dragons, but vampires. Mm. It is exactly what you're looking for. If you're into that kind of stuff at all, like, or if you think you can get into it, you can literally, like, you know, murder fuck people in that game. You you could do whatever the hell you want, dude. Mm. It's it's totally up your alley, man. So I'm not, surprised you haven't actually played it. I'm not. I'm not. I don't like card games. I don't like board games. I I am very antsy. I don't know if you picked that up about me. Like I, I'm I'm surprised I could sit down at the piano for a couple <laughs> hours because I want. I just always want to be moving. If I'm not moving, right. I'm sleeping. Those are the two. You either have me on or I'm off. There's no real middle ground. Okay. You know. In fact, I was napping right before I came over here. So you were off. I was I was out. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I got to be on the the Nova Chronicles. I better I better shore this up. 
Um, so anyway, the death cult trying to get the things on their side, they kidnap and murder little children. And then they put amulets inside their bodies as like a fertility ritual. And I'll just leave it at that because the, the reality of what they do is, is pretty disgusting. Mm. And one of the people that I was working with was like, dude, you got to take that out. That's, that's just not going to fly. That's like, bullshit though, man. Like, and especially in 2020, I think, you know, if there's, if there was ever a time to have stuff like that, it's yeah. now, you know, I could see maybe. Well, this was 2008 ish. You should be golden then, man, because like people eat this stuff up. Like that vampire masquerade thing is blowing up right now. Yeah, it's blowing up. Well, the, it, 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 it is doing extraordinarily well. Um, so long story short, was I finally committed to finishing this novel into because it, it was like a you know it's a six hundred page talk. Just sitting there, I, I hired a developmental editor. I hired all these people to help me like correct it and uh, get all the you know punctuation set. And then I reached out to a couple of my old editors and I'm like, who could I bring this to? Mm. And so they gave me a name of um, like an agent, an editor, and I think another agent. And then I was like sitting there working on the query letter. I'm like, I'm, I'm over this. This is not what I want to do. I don't want to have to like resubmit, especially after being a business owner for now over a decade and calling my own shots all the time and kind of being in command of my own financial destiny, right? I'm, I don't want to go back to like, hey, can you guys look at my bookie? Yeah. It's just not for me, right? So then I started looking into uh, the self-publishing technology of Amazon. This stuff is incredible. Like if I were a bookstore owner, not so much an independent bookstore owner, but like a book chain, I would be scared shitless about this technology because um, – it's incredibly powerful. It's incredibly easy to use. Now, with that comes a lot. It's hard to get credibility because the sure. second you say you're self-publishing, people are like, oh, it's because it sucks, right? But there's also now an entire tier of support structures. There's review magazines that will only support or will only review Kindle books, right? There's, there's websites that will only uh, support and pr promote Kindle books. So what I thought was like, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. As I was thinking of this next thing that I wanted to do in my life, I'm like, I have this book that I love that I've written. I also am really good at running businesses. What if I combine the two? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so this is essentially my new entrepreneurial endeavor. That, that was the real Nosferatu conspiracy right there, man. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I just thought, well, this would be an interesting. I've already been published, so who care? I don't need that feather in my cap any longer. And if somebody wants to look down their nose at me because I've decided to produce it myself, let them. I don't. I don't think... I don't think that anybody credible is going to be looking down their nose at you, Matt. Because, I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with the way um, mangas and web novels and stuff like that are written over in uh, Asia. I'm not. But a lot of these big, big animes that get produced tend to be – Self-done. Uh, self well, they, they artists tend to self-publish their light novels or their mangas or whatever. Uh -huh. And then you'll find these like kind of like A&R guys, you know, from whatever production studios. And they'll go through these sites, find it, whoop, grab onto it. Boom. Next thing you know, they're producing a 50-episode anime that might turn into a 500-episode thing. Like, yeah, very interesting. It, it, it happens, dude. So, well, see the thing, like just for example, to show you how much, just uh, just take a stab. It's, it's I always like doing this stuff because if you guess too high, that it ruins my 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 setup here. How much do you think that cost me to produce? Not in my own time. Like I say, so let's just say I I so did the paper, the I, ink, I, I editors. Des I designed the cover, but then I sent it to a cover designer to like make it better because I, I wasn't really vibing. But that was I'm like, this is the concept I want for the cover make it like a proper cover. So I hired a cover designer. I hired a developmental editor, which is the person that goes through, wait, your character in this scene, why is he doing this? Because you, okay. as, as an author, you you know what your characters are up to. So you may have them behave in a certain scene and the and reader's like, wait, it. what? Yeah. Why yeah. would he do that? But like, oh, because when he was 13. Okay, that needs to be somehow here to make sense. So that's a developmental editor will help you with that. Fix plot holes, maybe chuck around some of the pacing. You know, this scene's too long, chop it up here. And so once you get done, you go back and you do it again. And uh, then I, you have to hire a copy editor, which is the person that goes through, for example, um, in this, that talks about tentacles in this book mm. at one point in time. Uh, I had not written, I was reading tentacles, but what I had written was testicles. So like ah. the whole thing. And so finally, I mean, it was really funny because I'm like, oh my God, this almost got put out into the world talking about the the beast's testicles. In a, like, in a different category on Amazon <laughs> Books, a, man. It's yeah. a whole now we're talking about some manga anime <laughs> shit, right? <laughs> so anyway, so that's why you do a copy editor. And then sure. uh, then uh, if you look at like how nicely the, like see how well like the page flow is, 
that's called a typesetter. So the typesetter goes through and makes the book look pretty. And then finally, you want a proofreader to go over it and do it all that way. So just out of curiosity. So the whole how, enchilada, how, how much, much do, do I think, think that costs to produce? production wise? Yes. Five to 10 grand. Yeah, that's actually pretty close. It was about $4,800 with all, because one of the copy editors I paid twice to go over it just because I wanted it perfect. Mm. Um, so, but like, if you think about it this way, because the problem with self-publishing is most self published people, they're going to write their book. They're going to have the, maybe they're, oh, well, my aunt's an English teacher. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And they'll get yeah. it out. They'll, they'll make their own cover on Photoshop. And like, to me, that's bullshit because I, it's not bullshit to publish your own work or believe in your own work to do it that way. But to put out some like subpar. You want a level of professionalism exactly. that, that somebody with experience can actually bring to the product. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, this is a product. Right, like exactly. it's, it's your work, but it is a product. I'm it not that kind of sell. artist. You, you, uh, I'm I'm the kind of artist who wants to sell my work. Right. So I'm, I'm. Well, you're a businessman first, right? Uh, I, I, I I I don't know what the hell I am these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you up to other than the book, man? What was what? So we know we know the book's going on. Is there what's the next step? You're writing more, obviously, but yeah, well, you said you're doing some more business stuff. What's that? Well, I had more uh, as the copy editor that got a hold of this was like, dude, this is you need to maybe not self-publish this. You, you could put this at a real press. And I'm like, no, nah, I want I want to try and just see. Because worst case scenario, it's a concept. Then I can engage people be like, look, I got two more books. I've sold X amount of copies, which is more than you could probably sell. And like currently I'm on track with this book release due to the, you were talking about the trailer and all this stuff. Like I did, I, ser I was serializing it on Instagram. And uh, this book in the first two months has sold more copies than all of my other books combined. Mm. So I realize I'm like, maybe it's just because it's about vampires. I don't know. But I'd like to think that I, I would like to think that the effort that I put into it sure. to prof professionally produce it, because if you're not professionally producing, um, I think that brings down the movement. If you're going to go at these big five publishers, right, or any publisher and say, we can do it our own. We have the technology and the tools to do it as independent artists. And then you put out garbage, right? you're screwing over everybody. Whereas I know that I use the same tools and resources as Penguin Putnam to produce this book. Right. The only differentiation was uh, I just decided to put it out there myself. And so far I'm having the time of my life doing it. I'm, I'm re I've never enjoyed anything more in my life. Well, maybe my classical music studies, but um, this is, uh, I'm having a blast. So you, you're, you're planning on just focusing on the book thing then? Uh, well, the problem is, you know, the, the amount of volume that you have to, I would, I was looking at my projections the other day, like, oh, hey, what if this keeps up? What are these different scenarios? I have some more reviews, more promos coming out and things of that nature. And then the next book follows and then the third book. And then there's a prequel series that I'm working on. And I, once all six of those books are out, it's quite feasible or maybe even two to three of them. It's quite feasible to make a living off of doing this. Yes. So do you find yourself to be somebody that tends to focus and fixate on one thing? Or do you like to play around with a bunch of stuff in the pot? Uh, currently I still own a manufacturing business in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and that's why I disappeared for two, that project was supposed to last three months and it lasted two and a half years and mm -hmm. I almost got stuck in Albuquerque. It was really something else, man. I love Albuquerque. It's just, I don't love living there. It's have you been there? To no, New I haven't. <laughs> New Mexico, New Mexico is gorgeous country. Like just stunningly beautiful. I always imagine it was just desert. I mean, that could be. Yeah, there's something. It's not. It's there's something about it though, man. Is it desert though? It is. It's it's high plains. Yeah. Okay. It's like high plains drifter shit. Gotcha. I was Clint Eastwood in the whole time. It was badass. I was always walking around with six shooters and spurs. Nice, yeah. dude. You gotta get that nine iron on your hip. You know? I just wanted you guys to think I was cool. You are cool. Come <laughs> on. He's got a book about vampires. How much cooler does it get? So yeah, there's two more books in that series. Uh, the next the next book is called The Sommelier, and it's about the quest for the last remnants of Vlad Dracula's blood. And the sommelier, the wine steward, has the bottle of blood. Uh, it takes. It's basically like a World War One vampire disaster slaughter fest. Hmm. Um, and Elizabeth Bathroy is also in the book, who was um, the one of the world's first known serial killers. She was a Hungarian uh, land baroness who basically murdered and ate children and oh, bathed fun. in their blood. She's a real, really nice lady. Yeah, she seems like it. Um, so she plays a huge part in the next two books. Uh, but I don't want to get into it more than that. No, you should, man. You're already spoiling a lot. Dude. Let, well, let these right. just pique their curiosity. Pique their curiosity. You know, that's what I'm trying to do. But I, <laughs> I'm also here to say, you know, a lot of why I why I'm, I I would prefer not to have to do. Um, I would like to just stay alone in my room, right? That's just I, I'm very reclusive. Is it because of the 
the itis that's going around or more just oh, in general? I don't general, even care like... about that. I used to, I showed up without a mask. I'm not, <gasps> don't say that on air, man. I mean, I had that mask on when I showed up. Yeah. And, you know. You uh, were in a full biohazard I, th- suit. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what, that's, that's, that's my look anyway. Right. You know, that's sort of how I dress. Um, but. Where, what were we talking about? We were about? talking about, uh, you, you were saying that you tend to just like staying in your room. Oh, right. Uh, so I still don't remember what the hell I was talking about. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, we were basically going off of, um, uh, we were, we, I told you not to spoil the premise, yes. right? And then you were going off saying, well, I don't really leave my room. And then it just Oh, the like, interviews and stuff like that. Yeah. Because I would prefer to, not, I, I have to get out in front of this if I'm going to do it what I want. Mm. And, you know, do, I've, this is like the third podcast I've done and I have two more interviews lined up. Ideally, I would not have to do stuff like that. Not to be a jerk because I'm very appreciative of doing it. Um, but my natural inklings would be to stay behind the curve. I, I would like the work to be out there. But me personally, I'm, I'm like not entirely comfortable with that. Isn't that counterintuitive, though? Because how are you supposed to sell your product exactly if you're right. not putting yourself exactly. out there? Or, I mean, so let me ask you this question, sure. right? Businessman to businessman. Sure. How was your social media campaign? Because I'm assuming that's what you focus primarily on, right? (laughs) It's funny that you ask that um, because I am the Ebenezer Scrooge of social media. Mm. I really don't like it. I think that in many ways, social media, uh, if you want to get weird, sort of Lovecraftian about it in a way, I think it's an artificially intelligent, like, by the way, this is sort of a joke. I don't want people thinking I actually believe this, (laughs) but it's sort of like, it's a, it's like a brain virus that gets in the fucking people's head and makes them do stupid shit. So there's, to me, there's an evolution happening between those who understand that and those that don't, right? And you sink to intellectual depths there's just a dearth of intellectualism on uh, social media, right? Mm-hmm. That said, so I was off it for many years because I, I just like, I don't, you know, I was dating this girl at the time. She'd be, oh, my friend from college unfriended me. And I'd be like, oh my God, really? But so, so was, important. You don't know now. So, so I thought to myself, I'm like, well, I need to promote this book. I better, I better, I need fans. I, yeah. I need somebody who thinks this is interesting. So I created an Instagram um, and I started serializing the book. And then suddenly, I, so I made a personal page too. I'm like, well, maybe I'll just put up my piano progress, whatever. And it's, there's no harm in it. Right. And then like, if, if like a friend of mine doesn't like a post of mine, I'm like, Hey, what's up? <laughs> so You're about to unfriend that person is yeah. what's going to happen. So I've fallen into the pit. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's awful. So but I, how was the, uh, like, what did you find about the, the whole engaging with social media to promote a product process? Like was, was it well, a lot working of it was, out for you? Was it not? A lot of what I'm doing here is because my idea is to start my own publishing imprint, right? That's what I'm after long term. But I want to see, do I like doing this? Can I do it at all? Right. Because right? starting a business is one thing. Being successful at starting that business is another thing. And then sustaining and growing that business is a whole, different a whole other animal, yeah. right? You know, I've I've swapped in and out of business ventures over the years. I mean, in fact, I tried to start a convenience store chain in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I I don't know. Why not, man? I mean, there's no harm in dipping your toes in the well, water. Well, there's, there's a big development going on in downtown Albuquerque, and I be, love living in downtown LA. So I watched downtown LA rise from, uh, you know, Crackville to fancy swanky sushi restaurants. And so the same thing was happening there. And I'm like, they don't have any bodegas. They don't even know what that is. So I tried to start like a bodega chain and it, they were just like, wait, I can get it's downstairs in my apartment. I can get everything I need right here. And I'm like, that's right. And then two days later, I'd see them walking by with their Walmart bags. And oh, I'm like, oh, this you is, were too early, dude. I'm fucked. You were too early. Yeah, that thing crashed and burned within, I think, I think I made it seven months. Part of it was because I really wanted to move back to Los Angeles so there, that was weighing. I'm like, I think I could pull this business out, but knowing knowing that's two more years of me stuck here, no friends and family, I'm out. Were you born in LA or did you move here? I was born in Youngstown, Ohio, at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. But were you? So did you move here when you were young? I moved older to in San life? Francisco when I was 20. I moved in 1998, so okay. 22 years ago. How was San Francisco? Do you prefer San Francisco to LA or? I prefer. San Francisco to Los Angeles aesthetically. Right. I it's think, a beautiful oh city. Oh my God. It's just sweeping. It is. Man. It and really I is, used man. to have this, I used to live, um, well, my zip code was the uh, Pacific Heights, but my neighborhood was Western Edition. Like I lived, Western Edition is a little, like we live right across the street from projects. Like we were okay. broken into while we were home. Oh, fun. Yeah. And I have, so I have a temper. So one night my roommate's screaming and I walk it. She's just freaking out. And there's a guy in her room. Right. And she's like, Oh, there's a, yeah. So I run outside and I see him and I'm yelling at him. Like, eh. 
So then I, I, and I, was, I was getting ready to go jogging. So this is like six, seven o'clock at night. It's not late. So I'm, I'm putting on my shoes. I hear her scream. I have one shoe on now. I run out of the front of the building, chase this man into the projects with one shoe on. And then suddenly, like, there's like a, these like kind of buff teens on BMXs and they're circling me. And I'm like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is how it ends. It was like a so, scene out of Mad Max or yeah, something. Yeah, I was like, oh, like, I didn't really think this. They have like material. mohawks and fucking. They were just really strong young men, <laughs> you know, just like. And so I'm yelling at the guy, and I'm like, how do I, what do I do to mitigate this situation? <laughs> and the, finally, like the the leader's like before me, and he's just staring me down, and I'm like, this, I'm dead, I'm dead, I, I am so dead. And he's like, why you only got one shoe on, dude? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, because that that guy. Broke into my house. Yeah. He's like, well, go get him. And I'm like, well, now it's all broken. Yeah, He's gone. He fucked it up. <laughs> I got, I'm scared. <laughs> like, what do I do? And I think the, I think the, the one shoe saved me because I think they're looking at like, this crazy son of a bitch ran over here with one shoe. Like, he's got intentions. Let him do what he's going to do. Yeah, he walked over all those needles, you know what I mean? So the best part was, I so I would jog up to the Presidio and then over the Presidio and I, you could jog across the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, you want to talk about a jog? I'm a jogger. And it's just, it's, it's now I jog through Skid Row over the bridges because it makes me feel like Rocky Balboa. It's all industrial. The train tracks are there. You got to jump over human feces. Like it's, it's a real difference. Pass. I'll pass. <laughs> yeah. My friends tell me I'm crazy to do it, but I don't really think it's that big of a deal. I mean, to each his own for sure. Right. But like me personally, I'm not a jogger. Uh, well, but I'm even if I was a jogger, I mean, I'd prefer, I don't know, like, jogging through Beverly Hills or something, you know? Well, I would like, prefer that too, but in order to, like, if I have to drive my car somewhere <laughs> to Beverly Hills, it, uh, it's over. So how, I, I guess, how is it living in I downtown? I don't like man? leaving the house. It's not my thing. I like to do stuff. I just want to do it on my own terms. For know? sure. But so, but you obviously, you know, walk around the city, you yeah, explore yeah, yeah. what's going on over here. Sometimes like, you if, live here. So. Yeah. If I'm feeling a little claustrophobic, I, I like to take a walk around downtown. What's it, what's it like living in a downtown you know, city area. Well, my dream would be now to, I, 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 New York city is my favorite place on the planet. I love New York. I love all of New York. I love Queens. I love Brooklyn. I just, I love, I love Harlem. I love, I love Chinatown. Mm. Like anywhere in New York is an experience. Like it's just the one place in the world where I don't sleep. If I go to New York, I'm never inside. I'm always out walking and doing stuff and just experience like the city. It's, it's one of the rare cities that like, legitimately inspires me as a human being. There's just so much and so much culture. It's, and it's real. Like New York was built, you know, like watch Gangs of New York and realize that I and, am. and how it built. Whereas Los Angeles is relatively artificial. It's a newer city. And I look, I, LA is in my blood. I love Los Angeles. I would never disrespect LA. I'm super pro LA. I love LA culture. I love everything about the city. But I would prefer to live in Manhattan. Oh. So the reason why I live in downtown LA is it's the closest. It's like diet East Village. Manhattan light. It's Manhattan light. Now there's people that would disagree, but I'm like, can I just have this? Can I just call it, man? Just give it to me. That's all. It's up to you, man. You take whatever you want. Dude. Um, so, but I like it cause you know, I, I don't really like driving and getting anywhere else is a pain in the ass. So walking around almost like I have two gyms that I go to. One's literally across the street. One's four blocks away. Instacart brings me my stuff. It's, it's sort of idyllic specifically. Um, yeah, it it just it just sort of feeds into my reclusiveness. But the but the interesting thing about it was when I was living in Albuquerque, I was super lonely. It was it was like it, I was starting to get like uh, Jack Torrance in The Shining, mm. where I was just like standing staring out the window, uh, yeah. like, you know, yeah, Cat Candy Boy, fever, man. Yeah. yeah, it was it was really bad. So was there nothing to do out there or what? It's like, not that. There's a lot of like there's um there's a lot of outdoor activities, but the nightlife yeah. isn't really quite there. They a lot of the restaurants haven't quite figured out. You don't realize what a gift a, a large urban center is until you move away. Mm. Uh, and again, I don't, I don't want to, uh, cause I still have friends and um, business ventures. I'm not, dis I just want to be clear. I'm not dissing Albuquerque. No, I mean, I, I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that, man. You can't compare a city with 15 million people in it to a city with however many. Yeah. They have a less. million and we got what, yeah. four and a half, something like that. Dude, I was in uh, Ogden, Utah a couple of years back. I lived there for almost a year uh -huh. and I don't know how many people live in Albuquerque, but one million. I, I guarantee you Ogden has significantly less. Yeah. It's about was it 30 miles north of Salt Lake, right? Um, there was one the, the coolest thing about living there though is is exactly what you were describing about living here in downtown LA. There's one street, 25th, where everything is just located. You right. know what I mean? Everything. The one club in the city is there. Yeah. All the bars are there. And it, it's an interesting experience to be able to just 
walk down the street and like you know everybody and you get to pop into this bar that bar go there go there you know right. but there's that huge but where you know it's artificial right like that street was created to give you the sense of you're living in a big city right 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 because the minute you take a side street down you're like fuck what is this yeah it's one horse town yeah. at that point yeah it becomes really well, jarring the, the other thing culturally was a big shift for me because in LA like I have friends in their 70s in LA like I hang out I'll hang out with them I'll, you know like an artist buddy of mine he's like 72 or 73 mm -hmm. And I have friends in their early 20s. I have friends mid-30s my age all over the map. You know, and we all sort of bond and get together because we have the shared experience of Los Angeles, right? Uh, and we're active people that like to experience art, culture, whatever. Uh, there is very provincial. So people get their families and that's it. So when I would go out, you know, as a 43, 44-year-old guy, people are like, why are you not at home with your family? I'd be like, well, I don't have one. What the What's wrong with this guy? Like it was, it was very challenging to make and bond with friends out there because being so, um, it was fish out of water for sure, mm. you know. Um, but it was, uh, it was an interesting time in my life. Uh, so when I moved back to LA, it was nice to this. The, the city keeps me company. Right. That's the nice thing that I like about living in a city that there's just something about. I don't want to get like cheesy romantic on you, but there is something about the pulse of a city. And it's like, it's in a weird way, I walk with it. You know, it's like a friend of mine that I can rely on and draw from. I mean, who knows? You know, it is interesting to think about the fact that more people don't live in big cities than do, right? Like, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I big, think. Big, big cities. I'm sorry. Like, if you were to look at the total population of the United States, yeah. right? Like, if I'm not mistaken, more people live outside of these large metropolis right. areas. Hence the Electoral you know. College. Yeah, correct. You know, because if 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 not for the electoral college, then everything would be Los Angeles and and so, but like New York. living here, you almost get tunnel vision. I think. And oh, if you, for sure. You almost ignore or forget the fact that like this is a really, really you know as big as LA is. This is a tiny little portion of the United States, man. This is a massive country. Yeah, it know? is. Like, Drive across it sometime, specifically Nebraska, which I think takes like fourteen hours. To drive across the state, I, I could be exaggerating and wrong. You might not be because I know Texas is like you can from one point to another. You could go a couple of days driving across. I like to embellish sometimes for for a comedic and <laughs> or um, dramatic effect. It's entertaining. I'm an author. That's what I do. Um, but I remember when I first moved, when I was driving from Ohio to move to California, when I hit Nebraska and it gets flat and it's the same. It seems like the same silo over. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just driving and I'm thinking to myself like. Is this perfect? Am I dead? <laughs> I didn't make it. They came down and it, grabbed you. And it like... just kept, Nebraska just kept coming at me. And I'm finally like, I, finally, when you start getting near like Colorado, and the, <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay, I, I'm going to, the second I made it across Nebraska, I'm like, I'm never going back home. I'm going to be here for, because when you first move away from a small town, everyone like teases you like, oh, you'll be back. You can't make it in the big city and all that jazz. And uh, that was the, the, the moment I knew that they were wrong was when I made it through Nebraska. I'm like, there's no, I'm only California from here on out. Like that's it. I'm, it's, I'm not ever having to drive my stuff back across that state again. Have you done a lot of cross country stuff? Like, are you, no, no, I'm a flyer. Okay. I like a good flight. And specifically what's really cool is I think it's jet blue does uh, like midnights out of LAX to New York. So you go on, you get in your jet blue, it's midnight. And then you fall asleep hour or two in the flight, and then you just wake up in New York City. It's, it's excellent. I don't know how you can fall asleep on a plane, but I can't do it. <laughs> it's man. really the last time I was in New York. Um, it's, I did this. So I, I, I arrive in New York like six, seven in the morning, and one of my good friends, she's an attorney out there, and I, I don't think she was awake yet. So I, 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 I had a cab take me into the East Village. And this is the, I feel like this is the ultimate New York experience, right? As far as welcome to New York, motherfucker. So I, I, I finally get dropped off at this um, like cafe. This out, so it's an outdoor cafe. It's okay. summertime. And uh, I'm sitting there and I'm one of the first customers who are just opening. I can't, it's something like this, the Cowboy Star Cafe or it's some kind of silver, whatever. It doesn't really matter. And I'm sitting there. And I'm, I'm like, oh, I want the French. Now I'm on vacation. I'm getting it all. I want the French toast. I want the scrambled eggs. Boom. So they're putting that on the plate. And I'm sitting there getting ready to eat. And then suddenly I feel like, ah, oh, did I just get splashed with hot soup? And then suddenly I just realized there's like pigeon shit all over my foot. <laughs> and like on, like on my face. And I look up and there's this pigeon on a ledge like looking down like, yeah, welcome to New York, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, 
So I go inside and I'm like, can I get a napkin? And they're like trying to, like, we're so sorry, sir. I'm like, no, this is honestly the coolest. Make cool- the pigeon apologize. This is the coolest. Bird. I thought that was like, the. I'm like, can we get a picture here? Where's the, get the pigeon, get it all. I want to like memorialize the whole fuck you New York experience right here. The fucking LA rats are getting to be about the size of the New York rats, dude, man. Those rats. They're getting gnarly, dude. I saw one the other day. I was yeah. like, what the fuck is that? Well, they construct uh, the construction that's going over here on uh, like right up the street. It's on the way to my one of my gyms, and the the rats they'll they like to hide in the cement because uh, those are hollow on the inside. Yeah, yeah. Right? And uh, they like to live in there. So you'll be walking, and they'll just ju- they'll just jump across the thing. I rats don't bug me. That's not a that's not a fear animal that I have. I don't. I'm not really afraid of most. Like you know what? Actually, funny enough, I'm afraid of weird I, I don't care about spiders i don't want spiders around i don't care about snakes i'll handle a snake mm. like i've touched a tarantula i've held a python I, I don't like prefer to do those things like i would prefer snakes and spiders to just chill out i don't even like weird dumb bugs I'm literally starting to itch all over but i'm afraid of horses really yeah horses like freak me out i've been i've ridden horses but when they come near me i'm like what the fuck it's i don't know what it is i don't if it's, if it's like this massive animal that i don't know how they behave like big like you know you just saw that whole tiger king thing yeah I no i heard about touch, it never touch I a tiger about it. no way well that's just common sense isn't it like, <laughs> yeah you, you would think <laughs> you know maybe, maybe i shouldn't go and touch this thing that's got teeth and claws that could kill me in one second like that would I, but I, I mean i like i admire big cats i just oh, don't sure they're beautiful i don't know like you ever see like they have them on jay leno and they'll, they'll jump up on jay leno i'd run right out of the studio yeah, fuck that no shit, way. Dude. And which is interesting because I'm I'm not easily jarred or rattled, but b- bigger animals I'm sort of like okay, let me just your uh, your fight your flight instinct is kicking, man. Yeah, but horses they're like the nicest animals. Uh, you say that, you say that, but apparently they got tempers, man. Yeah, I have a friend who um, lost part of her eye because of a, a horse kick. So I think that's they're fucking strong. So I guess I guess that's because the the thing that spooks me out about horses. It's, uh, their eyes maybe no it's it's that they're 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 large and powerful and i i'm not socialized with horses so mm. i don't know how they behave you know so i don't know what like is it like is this gonna kick me like what, what's it gonna do Does how, how many tarantulas and snakes and stuff did you have growing up man none none i've I, i've held one tarantula which is not that great of an experience it's like you, you hold it and you're like you just here take it take it yeah i had this buddy who had like a pet tarantula and he's like, you got to hold it. And I'm like, oh, God, here we go. So I just put it in my hand. You could hold it there. It just sort of like it does its thing. And it's just like, and you're like, okay, just take it back. He's like, no, you have to pick it up. I'm like, I just dumped it on. I'm like, I'm done. I did it. We happy. I Holding a tarantula is not that fun. I can't imagine it would be, honestly. Are you familiar with D'Antvort? Oh, the the artist. Yeah. Yeah. I love I think they're amazing. But he has a video. One of his videos, an evil boy maybe? One of his videos, he stands there. Um, what's his? Uh, what's the guy's name? I have no idea. I, Yol- I just know the. There's Yolandi, and then there's. Anyway, he opens his mouth and he he put a spider in his mouth and lets the spider crawl out of his mouth. That's that guy's hardcore. I think. Uh, have you seen? Um, you know Tyler the Creator. Uh, I'm aware of the name. He had a video where, like, he had some bug that he had stuck in his nope. mouth and had come out. Yeah, exactly. No, Good. why? Why do this, man? Why I, do this to yourself? I like to, th- you know, I like to entertain people with my writing, but I, so I, I understand the notion of entertainment. I'm not putting a bug on me. Would you eat a bug? No, I mean under extreme duress, probably. No, I, I mean like at a, you know, Michel- five, three Michelin star with a. No, you know that there's a there's a, a Guadalajara serves. Um, uh, like Yucatan, is it Yucatan? There's a there's a chain that serves essentially insect food in LA. Y'all passed, dude. Yeah, I'm saying yeah. I'm out. You, I, we walked in, and uh, there's like you know like crickets, like seasoned crickets. The, I'm like I can't. I'm out. I'm, Do you think people eat those because they actually taste good, or it's just like it's, uh, I think it's cultural. I think it's disgusting to us. You know, for example, if 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 I brought a hamburger into India, they'd want to kill me because right. you know this cows are yeah, sacred there. so that uh, beef is disgusting to probably that entire country uh, i think a lot of that's cultural i think eating a bug isn't really that big of a deal but to us where everything's processed and whatever i personally would only eat a bug if i if i if i was going to die i have a friend who, <laughs> i have a friend in uh, vegas who runs a um insect protein company so he makes protein powder that's like pulverized right. insects 
he seems to be doing quite well with it. What I'm curious about more is like uh, the effect on your palate. Like the, the cultural thing is one thing, right? But like, it, does it actually taste good? Because I mean, is you could say that there's an objective taste to something, right? Yeah, I, I would envision an insect would be either very salty or very sweet. I mean, I eat oysters. I'll eat weird shit. You know, I mean, I've eaten I've eaten fish eyeballs before. Yeah, that's yeah, not, not good. You don't like them? Oh God, no. really? Oh, I, 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 it was one of the most disgusting experiences I've ever had. <laughs> it was all I hated it. Fish eyeballs. <laughs> I was at this. Oh, I was at this like celebratory. Uh, it's actually right down here in Chinatown. I forget. Hop Wu was the name of the restaurant mm. in downtown LA, and they were having a um, like a celebratory hundred year. So I, I, a buddy of mine was a food blogger, so I got invited to it. And it's all it's Chinese soul food cooking. It's 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 okay, not so it's home home style. It, it's like, not General Tso's chicken. It's not fucking, beef and broccoli. Yeah, Kung it's, Tao like, and... it's like the real deal cultural right. stuff. And I'm trying to like it, they were pushing my limits with this stuff. And when the when the like it wasn't many fish eyeballs, but there's like a little plate with fish eyeballs. And you could tell they're all looking at me like, oh, that guy ain't gonna eat it. He ain't gonna eat it. I'm like, fuck you. I touched the tarantula. I'm gonna eat this shit too, man. I love your fish eyeballs. <laughs> This is the best. I'll be back next week. I don't know if it's a normal thing. I don't know if I don't know if it's a normal. I, I think it was a delicacy. What if they were just fucking with you, dude? Oh my god! Can you imagine? I never thought they set about out that. this like bowl of fish eyeballs and they're like, yeah, you fucking eat it, dude. That's probably what happened. Because come to think of it, I don't know if anyone else is eating the fish eyeballs. What a sucker! <laughs> <laughs> That's one of those things where you have to like watch them go first, just to be double sure. You know, like you eat this. Let me see. Yeah, I think I got boned on that. Oh well. <laughs> It's an experience. I mean, you know, that's one of the things as an author. I think you gotta you gotta collect experiences. So now, if you read a a realistic fish eyeball scene in my anything, you know, I've I've been there. Why not, dude? You may as well. Um, are you gonna continue with stuff like this, or are you gonna? I don't know. You know what I mean? Because you went from I, children to satire to vampire. Like, well, there's um, I like to play in the dark. I don't want to sound corny, but uh, I prefer. I enjoy my favorite genre. I think of anything is psychological horror, right? It's like what that movie Moon or something like. That. I think my opinion is The Shining is probably the greatest example of psychological. Yeah, so no horror. jump scares or no like. There's some jump scares in there. Um, what else would be good psychological horror? Uh, I think that did you see Midsummer? No, but then again, I'm not a fan of horror. Oh, okay, like I, I pee myself. Uh, I also like thriller. I like some drama. Um, I, I mean, I, I like all genres of things, but horror to me is the most authentic, um, way to write, uh, or, or, or storytell because I feel that the, the, to, to awaken, if, if you can awaken a visceral feeling of fear or discomfort in someone through, um, writing, I feel that's an interesting challenge to try to like partake in. And also I think very because for example you're talking about spiders and snakes right yeah. and you're just like eh, and i'm like yeah whatever what is it in you whereas i'm like a horse ugh, right and you're just like brian it's a freaking horse man. Yeah. that's your problem I'm like, yeah, you can just ride it i keep it over there man um i'm sure i could get the love they seem like lovely animals i mean i like to pet their faces and all this stuff so my meaning is fear is is a very personal experience like what scares you does not right. scare me okay so i think it, it's it there's a story to be told through horror, through suspense and these things like what, it, what, it, what is it, what is it that hunts you in many ways? So I like to sort of, there's the scary story and the, you know, this is, this story is a little bit more gory than normally I would turn to, but it, I, I wanted, I like to describe violence as it is. Um, but I think that psychologically horror and things of that nature present um, very, yeah, incisive or um, a way to look into yourself to sure. ask yourself why somebody could read that book and be like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever read. It's not scary. Right. Whereas other people are like, holy, they, like my hair, you know, one lady was like, oh, my hair raised up. Or at least that's what she said. <laughs> people lie. Just quote her. People lie. No, quote her. Have it on the Amazon storefront. Like this lady said, my hair I is actually standing did, on end. I did, I did quote one that came through on Amazon. I, I get a kick out of this one. I'm going to read this too <laughs> because I think it's real funny. But you're still going to entertain stuff in the horror genre. I then. think that's where I'm at. Like you're not going to jump to sci-fi all of a sudden. And uh, I would. I would. Horror well, sci-fi it depends. I, you know, I'm not as familiar. I, I would probably delve into fantasy sooner than I would delve into sci-fi. I love sci-fi though. I love Arthur C. Clarke, um, all that stuff. But 
uh, specifically anything around artificial intelligence mm. I'm, I'm, I'm very much into. But I don't necessarily know if I know the genre well enough to write within it. You know, because gotcha. I think, I, which could be a benefit in many ways, because you could end up, you could end up breaking some tropes that you're not aware of as a trope, but you could also end up really shooting yourself in the foot and and messing it all up. Fuck think this guy, you can't write for shit. Yeah, thinking that he's being original, he's not. So this this right. this is one of the reviews that I like the best. Says, um, "Wow, it takes a very messed up mind to come up with something this disturbed." <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I love it. I think it's hilarious. I think you should send them this podcast too, man. Yeah, Here, right? you could get you could get a closer look at my mind. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I, I think it's it's something to be said for um, uh, taking the ability to challenge people through through their fears. Sure. And to me, that I, I I look at like well done horror is high art to me. I really believe that. I mean, it, I guess it is. You know, because you're right about everybody has a different thing that scares them, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anybody on this planet that isn't afraid of something. You have to be, right? I mean, there's no, there's no like super stoic, like completely courageous person and who's just uh, nothing. Well, yeah, I mean, even if you look at like MMA fighters, um, I watch the, uh, uh, I'll sometimes pick up the Joe Rogan podcast and he seems to be frightened of uh, like reptiles or something. I, I thought it was like, he did a thing on alligators where he was like, uh. I mean, that's a, he's a bad dude, yeah. right? Um, so clearly he's not afraid of people, Yeah. but you know, he sees the, the, the alligator or the shark and he's like, uh, same way well, I get horses. He, at least I shouldn't be afraid of sharks. That sounds right. scarier. Um, but yeah, so uh, being able to actually cause that reaction is what gets you. I like that. Yeah. That's, that's what gives you your inspiration, I guess, to like. It does. I try to freak myself out. Like I, I've written the new scene. There's a scene in the new book that I'm developing right now that I had to stop writing the other night because I got such bad claustrophobia through it because that's like i guess my meaning is i feel that it's simple if i wanted to touch your heart right if i was like a drama writer or something mm. like that i could talk about you know oh, when he laid her to rest through her, her cancer ridden body and he knew that his treat like you'd be like oh this like that's easy yeah right um i think comedy writing it would be probably just as challenging to make people laugh through words, right? Because everybody has their own sort of. But I, I find that, I, I, I feel that to legitimately, I'm not even say scare people, right? I'm saying I, to disturb them. My intent is- Invoke some emotion. My intent yeah. is to disturb, Yeah. right? Uh, my intent is on specifically this series to make you question your reality on, wait, did this happen or you know, and clearly, if you're in your right mind, you know that vampires didn't take over St. Petersburg in 1916. Why not? But I position the narrative as like if you would read the real history story, you would be like, wait, that's how they covered it up, and this is how it really happened, right? So the best part when I started serializing it to see if it had any legs at all, because I'm, I'm like, well, I was just going to put it up on Amazon. I'm like, yeah, who cares, right? Just you honor the work; it's done. I don't have to talk to anybody. This is excellent. And then I started thinking like, well, let's at least see what it, if it has any legs. Um, so I started serializing. Just I would put up like a paragraph a day and put up a weird photo that I'd Photoshop to look, and then I'd get a like. I'd be like, "Oh, neat!" And then ten likes, and then suddenly, next thing I know, I had, at one point we peaked over two thousand followers, and people were sharing it around and talking about. It. I'm like, "Oh, wow! I think this might actually be something." So I started, instead of photos, my friend Shannon, who is a media expert, taught me After Effects. Mm. So I started doing what's called parallax, uh, which is I would take one image and animate it around another. And then that got more people. And I'm like, well, I've always liked filmmaking. So, then, <laughs> dude, uh, I feel sometimes that I reach intervention levels of when I, when I take on new ventures, I throw myself right at them, right? So having no filmmaking experience whatsoever, I decided to start shooting this in my bathroom on a green screen. Yeah. <laughs> so that trailer that you like so much, that was essentially... Like I was hired, my friend's a casting director. I'm like, hey, can you, I need a guy with a mustache that I could dress like Vlad the Impaler. And he's like, what, what are you up to now? I'm like, don't worry eh. about it. So the, this is, it done. this cracks me up every time. So the guy comes over to shoot the Vlad the Impaler. I, I basically picked out the costume. And this is like a working actor. I, I feel sorry because he'd probably be like, oh, well, why am I working with this weirdo? Hey. So here I dress him up like this. Do you know what Vlad the Impaler looks like? I mean, I do now. Let me show you the original photo that was based upon. I think it's really, it's, it's so this poor guy actually went through and did this with me. 
Um, but the, the funniest part of the story was the setup. So here's, here's Vlad the Impaler. Right? Okay. Yeah. And then this is the guy. So having no idea, I needed a, a, a dark room. I needed a studio. I didn't have one. So I, so there's him. Right. And then this is the setup in my bathroom. And I don't know if you could see the toilet right next to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this poor guy walks in and he's like, what kind of shoot is this? I'm like, look, <laughs> I, I know how this looks. I, I <laughs> like, I feel like he, I, he was thinking like, oh, this is super gay porn. Yeah, like, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. I'm like, we got to shut the door now. But so I, cause I needed him on the green screen in the dark, but, um, it was funny because I kept doing, I was shooting all of this in and around my loft essentially. Uh, and it's odd. I feel that it turned out moderately professional looking. How did you actually, that's something that I've been struggling with. How did you get a shot to look so decent in a, you know, more dimly lit room? Like, was I, it your lens, your camera? Like, what do you think you did that? I gave think it that? that's why it works. I think because I didn't know what I was doing, I wasn't properly, li- clearly not. My buddy Jordan was helping me out with these. He's actually the guy in the video with the white eyes that opens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, because I didn't know anything that I was doing, I don't, I didn't know lighting. I didn't know whatever. So I would do it all. I would just try to adjust the level. And I was learning editing as I was going in after effects as well. So I, it was just, if anything, the reason why it looks like shitty old film was because it was shot terribly and I was able to like, oh, that that just translates over perfectly. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? There was not, I, I would love to tell you like that was totally on purpose, but that was just- Oh, it, you shut it, up, man. Yeah, I mean, it was they totally- kept that mystique It going. was totally on purpose because, uh, you know, I, I studied, I studied, I went back and I studied a lot of the early filmmakers and I looked at what kind of lenses they were using and what kind of incandescent bulbs. So I actually found some of those antique bulbs. Yeah, those high CRIs, man. Exactly. Yeah. So then I, I lit, but then I realized we weren't happy with the <laughs> ratio. So we chose the 19 one to one. The only reason I know that is because I'm obsessed with this movie called The Lighthouse. No, I haven't you seen The Lighthouse? It, no. oh, this movie's awesome. Um, I mean, should I watch it? Oh, I, well, I don't know. I, I have is weird, it horror? I have bizarre taste. It's, it is, it's disquieting. Hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a fever dream is what it is. Okay. But it's, yeah, I think it would qualify as horror, but it's not, uh, I don't think it's going to scare you. Right. It should unnerve you. Well, that's, I'm fine with that. Yeah. So I don't like that ring shit, man. Fucking grudge ring. I like the ring shit. Have you ever seen The Descent? No. Scariest movie ever made. Pass. Easy. Hard pass. It. I still see the ring girl in the fucking mirror. Oh, see, I'm I'm not afraid of any of that stuff. I think, you know why I'm probably not afraid of that stuff is because I don't believe in ghosts. So because, so therefore when I see like a ghost portrayed, I mean, I get it, it's creepy. Like it can, un, 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 you know, the right imagery can unnerve anybody. But I don't, it doesn't generally, I actually have a thing, it's called Brian Gage's Haunt My House Challenge. And it's an open invitation to the entire spirit world and demons <laughs> where I'm like, bring it in guys. <laughs> I'm announcing it on your show. Like I'm not hiding from this. Brian Gage is on my house challenge. I'm wondering how much, like, so this, this will get a little interesting, right? Like, uh, do you think thinking things might have a little bit of an effect? Like the fact that you don't believe makes it so that it, it can't fuck with you? Or do you think that there's none of that just period flat out? Like there's no way. Well, I think the strength that what I don't, I enjoy all of that. I love paranormal stuff. I love aliens. I love Bigfoot. I don't love Bigfoot. That's a lie. I'm just saying shit now. Uh, I you love like the vampire like the bats, right? Yeah. I, lo- I love all of the, I love mythology folklore. But to me, when I hear about, you know, ghosts or demons or whatever, because the reason why I don't take a ghost seriously is when I'm, when people tell me the stories, like for example, I had a friend who was recently terrified because she, her house was haunted by a demon, right? And she lives in this little apartment in Hollywood. And I'm like, well, what's the demon doing exactly? Mm. She's like, well, one night I was in my bed and it opened the door uh, and it, it, the door opened all by itself. I'm like, okay, what else? Well, the other I was sitting in my kitchen and the cabinets opened all by themselves. And I'm like, that's not that scary, man. Like, okay, if this demon is so powerful that it has figured out you know, it has the ability to transcend the ether between space and time, defy all the laws of physics, being, being a materialist mass, but a, able to move mass at the same time. And the best that it's decided to do with those skills is open your cabinets in a shitty apartment in Hollywood. Like, I'm not afraid of that thing. I'm just like, thanks for the corn pops. I appreciate that. So like, as far as apparitions and hauntings are concerned, I just feel that like, if my house were haunted, right? 
uh, that would spook me out. Like if I turned on the thing and the ring girl was in the mirror the first night, I'd be like, oh my God, <laughs> gee, I pro- that's not, I'm not a fan of that. But right. the next night I'd be like, ah, I'd probably be like, okay, this is getting a little old now. All right. The, the third night she's third smiling night, like, at you. She gives you a wink. I like, just look, dude, I want to brush my teeth. Can you move the <laughs> yeah. fuck out of my mirror? And so then let's say it crawls out of the mirror and barfs black stuff all over me. <laughs> and then, you know, claws my face. I'm like, yeah, I got to move out of my apartment. And that's, that's a whole thing as well. <laughs> so like, if anything, that just proves that the afterlife exists. And I'm not going to forget that shit. I'm going to sit around. I'm going to be like, when I die. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be a ghost, and I'm gonna figure out what fucking ring lady. Go fuck with her, dude. And I'm gonna yeah, and yeah, maybe yeah. I start out as like a weak ghost, right? And you're the power because you could get into the mirrors and do all the physics breaking. I'm gonna train hard, and I'm coming at you. So I'm gonna because I got nothing but eternity now. And even if I come at you the first time and you beat me, I'm gonna be like, you remember that time when I just wanted to brush my teeth and you came barfed all over me with the black stuff and I had to move out of my apartment? This now nah, it's fucking revenge. Yeah, it's revenge, and then she puts me down, but I still got more time to train. What if she just like it's not a scary problem loved man and and she's just misunderstood, you know? Isn't that indicative of us all? Wow, that was deep. Yeah, I know. That I like to really I like to man. take it to some pretty deep places sometimes. That was um, So yeah, that's that's why I, I don't necessarily believe. Like look, paranormal all that stuff. I when people automatically go to like if for example, do you know what the um the fear frequency is? No. There's a frequency and I I believe it's somewhere in the area of like 18. Point seven, 18.3 Hertz. Anyway, uh, they have done studies where this frequency will have vibrative effects on the human body where you feel like something's in the room with you, even though it's not. Yeah, I can actually believe that. In fact, there was a, uh, the, the, one of the articles I read, there was a cathedral that like these tunnels led down to the uh, underneath center. And um, the, People were always seeing ghosts down there. So the scientists went down and they were like, oh, look at that, 18 point. It, it could be a different, it could be 16. I don't know what it is. But mm-hmm. they're like, ah, look, at that's the fear frequency. So people will, because somebody, somebody somebody was telling me, what they're like, well, I saw a ghost. What do you have to say to me? And I, I respect that. I believe that you believe you saw a ghost. That's fine by me. And I don't think that we should have to be angry at each other because I don't believe in that. But my question is, why did you automatically go to the paranormal? Right. Like if I turn on my mirror tonight and the, the haunt my house challenge and somebody accepts me on it and I got a bad demon in my house, my first thought is like, I need to get back on my bipolar medication. I think it's because we, we want something more. I, I agree you know? with that. Like we, we sit here and we do all this shit, our day to day, brush our teeth. I hope, you know, and yeah. you're kind of like, well, this is it, you know? So you, you almost want to seek these things out. You almost want there to be ghosts. You want there to be. Oh, demons, I do. You know what I, I mean? I want the Loch Ness Monster all day long. I would love to go there and check out Nessie. <laughs> I, I think that stuff's, it's incredible, right? Yeah, I get it. People do want more, but I do, what I, what I don't understand is I'm just not somebody who doesn't like to believe in something unless I'm a skeptic. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a contrarian, but no, I don't want to be too much. I get those people that always play the devil's advocate. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. fucking hate it. Well, like, I'm just going to play the, like, how about you don't play the devil's advocate and you just be fucking cool and positive. <laughs> yeah. How about, what do you say? Yeah, let's do it, man. That, so that's a learning experience. Yeah. So yeah, I just, uh, I don't under, I think the first reaction that if you see a ghost should be um, not to think that you, it does it, it just doesn't make it. Look, dude, why would you be afraid of anything? I could vibe more on interdimensional crossover than I could, like if I died, right? Why are all ghosts fucking with you? Like I would like to come home for my Haunt My House challenge and it's like I got a bunch of like, you know, Scooby and Jet Set playing the piano and having a ghost town jamboree at my house. I gotta be like, nice, this is great. How, how fun is this? I've got ghosts playing instruments in my house, right? But the, the, they're always evil. Like, you know, same thing, like werewolves, uh, th- shapeshifters, things of this nature. Like, no, hold on, hold on, fuck no off. S- what about Casper? The friend, well, he's fictional, as are Says who? all ghosts. Ah, get out <laughs> of here, man. Get Boom. out of here. Um, but no, like, uh, <laughs> are they all evil? Because now you got me racking my brain. I'm trying I to think. I just think, like, that, no, they're like, my thing is this like, if I, because, you know, it's always about somebody died and the, the, the spirit lingers right, on. Right. Yeah. Bad. Like, yeah. What a terrible way to spend your existence. I can actually vibe with the whole interdimensional thing. That kind of like, yeah, I can see that being a, that, a thing. You uh, know? I mean, I, I'm, I, I don't know exactly what has been done scientifically on that, but I'm pretty sure that they have confirmed the existence of parallel dimensions. Or is it seven? I parallel think it's universes? Up to, it's up to seven. Is that so what it is? Dimensions, I think we're, we know there's up to seven. I thought like dimensions that. went- I could be full of shit too. I thought dimensions went up to 15 dimensions. I don't fucking know. 
I, I watched, I mean, that's, uh, I almost said the dumbest thing. Jamie, can you put that up on the monitor? No. No. <laughs> I need a new Jamie, man. Can I replace him? He's like, no, I'm, I'm done. With, I'm, I'm done with this guy. Uh, <laughs> um, in any case, but like, yeah, we, I mean, we know there's there's more than the ones that we know of, you know, one, two, three, right? Obviously, there's a fourth. Yeah, fourth dimension, which so is let, let's time. just say it goes up to 15 even. Like, yeah, what, why can't there be... Maybe there's 11 dimensions. There too, dude. Yeah, you know, look, the fact of the matter is there... I have five senses, right? Some people believe they have a sixth sense. Fine by me. Um, it's your there's, pineal gland. There's light waves that I can't see and sound waves I can't Correct. hear. There's a lot more out there that we can't even perceive. So... Uh, there, there's more out there for sure, for certain. Um, you know, we can't even really quite comprehend what the universe is or how it behaves. But I, I just feel to me to blame it immediately on apparitions or ghosts or, or um, entities of malcontent. I Like, for example, you know, when people get possessed by demons, it's like, lady, you work at 7-Eleven. Okay. There's no demon. Like it, what, what is he going to poison the Slurpees? Like that's his big <laughs> evil demon agenda. Come on. He's going to undercook the Get taquitos, up. man. There's like, if that's what a demon, if a demon is possessing like, you know, possess someone who could like actually fuck shit up. Dude. Okay. Have you seen, uh, have you seen the video of that? I think it was on Joe Rogan too, but it, like I found it before I even saw that there's this video of a pastor guy. Uh, uh, doing an exorcism or something. No, man. He, he, He's talking to this lady uh, that kind of like jumped on him. She's a reporter. She jumped on him. She's like, hey, why do you have this jet and this and this and that? And, you know, all your people are, you know, giving you all this money. Like, what makes you, what makes it so that you could fly around in this private jet? And he's like, he says some shit. But the way he said, like, his eyes got really fucking big, dude. And his voice got really, and uh. what the fuck? If anybody was possessed by a demon, it would be that motherfucker. Dude, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I can and see that. And that, see, that goes along with your you know, train of train of thought, like that makes sense for him to be a demon. Yeah. He's a fucking famous pastor, you know, like who else would you want well, see, to infiltrate? That's the, see, that's the other thing too, is like, as far as demons are concerned, like maybe he's just a shitty guy. Well, he's guaranteed a shitty guy for <laughs> sure. You know, I just, yeah. I, but he I, might I, have a demon. In I want all the paranormal to be true, but, uh, I, I just, and it, that's the other, when I'm now that I'm doing paranormal, uh, you know, supernatural thrillers and paranormal mystery fiction, I would hate to lose, interest in my work yeah. because people are like, well, he doesn't believe in it. Like, well, I mean, I'm open to the prospects. I want to believe in all of it, you know? Um, prove the afterlife. I'll start going to church tomorrow. I'll be, I'll be in the first pew. I'll, be, I'll, I'll, be, I'll start doing like, Bible so, study. so what everybody else, man, you're going to have to fight off uh, a yeah. seven point, what billion, but then who's the right religion? Who do that I pick? That's hard too. That's really hard. Are you guys religious? I'm not religious. I'm not religious. But either. I believe in God. I don't even believe. Well, it's like again, light waves I can't see, sound waves I can't hear. But as far as like a like a an entity with a consciousness kind of plot in the chest, I don't even know if it's I'm, consciousness. I'm over I mean, that. Like, because if if you remove the religious aspect of it, right? Like, the, the very first thing that you find out about God is He's one and everything, and yeah. He's He is. That's it, right? Like, and the closest analog I think we'd have to that within the realm of science would be the Big Bang. Don't you think the Big Bang's a little bit um, simplistic? Who was it? Brian Green, that cat. Yeah, uh, is a theory. He, yeah, yeah, well, it's not his theory, but uh, he was talking about it. And I guess uh, if you really wanted to go deep into it, they were talking about how the Big Bang could have been one of many Big Bangs, and it all falls under the umbrella of many more big, ba it's like this infinite sort of like fucking thing that just keeps going and going and going. So yeah, I, my problem with that stuff is I feel to me, it sounds like scientific religion, right? It sounds like scientific mm. creation myth to me. And I just, because it's still the big bang theory and no one's proven. And I understand they've done their mathematical models and et cetera, that it, but it's still, it just seems too simple of an idea, like I don't want to park there, M me personally, like the scientific community obviously can do whatever the hell they want. I'm not a scientist, but m for my own intellectual understanding of how I like to perceive the world, the Big Bang to me falls very short as far as, like why does it have to begin at all? Maybe that's just the human psyche. Maybe it's always just been there and that's the way that it is. There was no Big Bang, right? Now obviously there's contractions and expansions and things of that nature, but I don't, I, I just feel like the Big Bang seems like, it's like, it feels like a cheat to me. There's probably scientists and physicists that would like boo me for saying such a thing, right? 
Um, but I, I'm not I'm not questioning the validity of how they came up with that. I'm just questioning the sense like, guys, okay, cool. What else though? Right. Right. Because I feel stopping here because of all the physics I haven't studied, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't stack up to me as a thing. I mean, I think that's what kind of makes the whole physics science fascinating, right? Like more so than any other is that it's mostly all theoretical. Like we, there's right. relativity has been proven time and time again, right? Yeah. Like Einstein's been proving himself post his death. I but... just saw something last week where they had, uh, they had done it again and yep. they found one of the telescopes found something that, that it was proved one of Einstein's theories. I read that shit too, but I forgot what it was. Same. That's how it, that's, come on, man, you're the host. Uh, Bring it up. Yeah, but I, I need my Jamie to be on point, uh, man. If only there was like some easily accessible database of all human knowledge ever, like we could just, you know, like look it you up. You have it on mute, dude. You can't be pulling that Wouldn't thing that out. Dope? Looking, right? You know, look, look at this. What are you, you have a computer. <laughs> I sort of like, he's fired. You know what he is? He's like your personal Han Solo. He doesn't give a shit. He's just like, yeah, fuck it, man. I wanted him to be the host originally, man. You didn't want to do it. I like the devil may care attitude. That's what that's what you get with, for working with musicians. Uh, is that's that what right? What, what do you play? Uh, everything, man. Oh, cool. Yeah. You play piano at all? Uh, but a little bit. Yeah. Do you feel what I'm saying about like the touch? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. It's, it, all, it's like dynamics of, you know. Look. Those when I watch some of these like old ninety year old concert pianists and the way they play is incredible to me. You know, I can't I I can't seem to. Uh, wrap my head around the level of precision and control that they have over this instrument. I mean, you're talking people that have been practicing for decades, right? Oh, for sure. Well, you know, that's one of my, I mean, I've always met, I've been messing around with piano uh, since I was in my early mid twenties. Um, but I never took any lessons. And then I go through pocket, like a year where I try to learn a bunch of stuff and I, you know, five years off. So finally, when I started re, when I enrolled in school three years ago, um, I thought I was the shit because I'm like, oh, I could watch this Beethoven. And my, all my instructors are concert pianists. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it might sound a little bit. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't have the, I didn't know how, like to normal people, if you don't understand the nuances that they're doing, yeah. you wouldn't know. But when you start hearing the differentiation between, okay, well, this legato ties into this staccato, which turns into detache with a, you know, there's all these minute things that they can do with this thing that just does this. It's incredible. It's the 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 the, the scopic uh, auditorial um, way that this instrument can communicate is fascinates me. What about what does that inform us of the mind of the person who invented the damn thing? You know, I was thinking about this the other day, and there's certain things in the world that are somehow perfect. Right? Like, you play guitar? Yeah. When's the last time you've seen a viable upgrade to a guitar besides the electric guitar? The 12 string. But the 12 string has been around since they had lutes back in the 15, yeah, 1600s. No, whatever, that's my favorite. Oh, all right, gotcha. I don't care. <laughs> I do, I like a good 12 string myself. High Plains Drifter. Um, so I just feel that it's, it's a perfect instrument, it, right? Yeah. The piano is a perfect design yeah, of the instrument. Definitely. And I mean, you could do s some sort of, you know, architectural things where you see like fly pianos or pianos that are balanced weird, but the guts of the way that it sounds, it comes down to the, it comes down to the harp, it comes down to the soundboard, it comes down to the strings, the hammers and all of that stuff. So I find it very interesting to see that like, to me, musical instruments are often pinnacles of human creation due to like, they're perfect. They sound, per they, they function, like form and function fold onto this object. And the, the, the result of that is just not the object itself, but the levels of creation yeah. that can, can come on top of it. You play guitar different than I play guitar, right? As did, I don't know, uh, Chick Webb played the drums different than John Bonham. So I don't know. I, I, I that's why I, I'm, I'm not so, I don't really consider myself to be a musician so much because I feel real musicians would be like, oh, that's cute. You know, oh, you're little, you get to play a little jazz box there. Uh, that's cute. <laughs> um, hey, man, if you could play Master of Puppets, you're my best friend. I, uh, I haven't touched a guitar in like eight years. So, oh my God. can you play Master of Puppets? No, 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 I don't know. What's, what's your genre? Uh, well, I listen to everything, man, but oh. uh, never really got into Metallica. Yeah. I love the Metallica. I like I like I like metal in general though. Oh hell yeah! Yeah, like I, mean, I love Nine Inch Nails. Like one of my favorite. Oh, yeah. Trent Reznor is one of the great geniuses of our time. Yeah. 
period. Is, is he still doing stuff? Or did he drop oh, off? hell yeah, he is. He is? Movies, scores, Just put out a new album, sure. Bad Witch. It's a great album. His stuff gets, he's, he's a, he is, he's one of the most, vi- like, you know, this is a guy back in, comes out of Cleveland, Ohio or something, Sharon, uh, maybe Sharon, Pennsylvania in the late 80s. And then it goes on to win Academy Awards for uh, composition. He's, he's a, he's a very unique artist to where I think he'll be looked at historically as one of the great musicians of our time. Hmm. That's my opinion. You know, I feel that way about is uh, Maynard. I love Maynard tool is, is tools. One of my favorite bands for sure. You know, it's fucked up. I still haven't heard the new album. I didn't even know they had one. So I guess I don't like tool that much. I don't oh, know. <laughs> caught him up. We caught him up, dude. Yeah. I, you, you busted me. Oh man. Uh, what about Rammstein? So uh, now I'm wait, just trying to think of the new stuff that's is that Du Hast like, Mish? That's the one. That's all I know from Rams. Okay, oh, that's fine. They're sort of like in that uh, that Knights of Reb, uh, KPF or uh, KMFDM, K- Kill What's Motherfucking that? Depeche Mode. Uh, no, KMFDM. Yeah, what like that, that industrial, that that late sort of '90s industrial. Mm. The Knights of Reb. Is that the, the stuff pop lead like- itself? <laughs> um. Yeah, it's it's very. I feel like E du Hast, me like that. It's the same kind of music. Mm. Ministry was in that genre ministry. a little bit. Okay, yeah, yeah, Skinny yeah, yeah. Puppy. I see. What, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they all Almost, fall. They, it's the stuff all the gothic kids listen to. Yeah, like the more hardcore. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love Skinny Puppy. Like if you're gonna go to Das Bunker. Ah, oh, I love Das Bunker. Yeah, you'll see. I saw them Fair. Skinny Puppy. Are they actually, still doing Das Bunker? Bunker? I have no idea. That place has opened and closed and opened and closed so many times. What an interesting thing, facility. I'm talking about the one that was like the upstairs. It, it was, yeah, yeah. So it, it you you walk in, they have uh, that big old hall. There's a room on the um, there's a hallway you could go down. There's another room that's off onto the left of that hallway, and then they have that all the way off onto the right, the right. upstairs and downstairs section. Yeah, uh, the only thing that I've never really liked about I like the aesthetic of goth culture, but I, I, I it's just too much work for me, man. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, like, like, you mean I gotta wear a special pair of pants or some shit? I'm just like, can dude, I just... Hot Topic will hook you up. I'm 47. I just feel like, you know what I'm saying? I, I feel like I'm a satire. Like, I feel like if I show up with like the the, I put the ring in and I goth out, whatever. I feel like people go home and make fun of me at that point. That's honestly my biggest fear of getting like, my biggest fear about getting old uh. is if I'm gonna be able to still rock the clothes that I want to rock. You know I what think I mean? you can do like, whatever. What I'm learning about aging is I think that you can do whatever the fuck you want. You don't think that you're going to hit, let's say, like 60 and suddenly your your pants are going to go over your belly button? I do everything I can to avoid. I have obesity in my family. Mm. So I do everything that I humanly can to um, keep the belt loop the same. Right. There's. I think once you crack 45, like, I mean, you see some of these people that have like perfect bodies. I don't know what they're doing to themselves to achieve that because I eat extraordinarily strict every day. I do intermittent fasting. I don't, I don't eat my first meal. In fact, I haven't eaten today yet. Um, and we're what, like, what, eight o'clock? No, it's, it's later than it eight. is. Oh, yeah. I'm talking you're up. How long does this go on for? As long as you want to go, man. Uh, I don't know. I'll, oh, dude, keep that, going. Don't give me that. We can wrap it up. We'll be here till like midnight. He'll be like, dude, this guy needs to shut the fuck up. <laughs> Uh, it's only eight. Feet. I don't feel bad chatting you up for sixty-five minutes. I feel that's fair. We can keep going. I don't. I don't mind either way. Anyway, and then uh, so I ex- I exercise heavily every day, mm. and all I can all I can do with that is keep my belt loop the same. That's it. I mean, how much of it has to do with body type and stuff too, man? Because like genetics, I'm sure plays a huge. Yeah, role I got in Nordic that, you blood know? in me, and I, my body wants to sort of hibernate that Viking winter. Mm. I think. Um, you need my, to go pillage and my grandfather was Swedish. So, uh, and then, uh, I think it was the rest of it was like Hungarian, English, and Irish. So I have that whole sort of cold white guy thing that like, I, I want, I want to be, I think my body <laughs> wants to be like a jovial, like, you know, eating strudel cakes or whatever. You know, I just think that that's my body wants to balloon up. Yeah, it's tough, man. I mean, like I haven't shifted weight in like a couple of years at Lucky. least. I've been sitting steady at about 168 to like 172 and I don't do shit. Like I, I intermittent fast as well. Like yeah. I haven't eaten anything all day either. Well, that's not true. I like earlier in the day, but it was just like this tiny little thing, you know, so I, I get hungry like that. I love intermittent fasting insofar as it's, it's the lazy man's way to eat. 
you know, because then you don't have to, cause I, I hate having, I, the other weird thing is my diet during the week, Friday, Saturdays is I'll just do whatever. Cause no. I don't want to be that guy at the bar. Oh, I don't drink carbs. Like, fuck you. I'll drink all the beer. Right. But I won't drink Sunday through Thursday at all. Um, because I just want to sort of keep the, the, that's, I don't think people realize like they're not, I was having a, I floss every night and I was having this conversation with my friend. He's like, oh, that floss is bullshit. You don't need no, to do that. He, and Hell he was no, in his like, not. he was like, he was in his late twenties, early thirties. And I'm like, dude, you have a dentist appointment coming your way around 43 years of age. That is going to fuck your world up yeah. if you don't start flossing now. You know, it feels amazing. I don't know why you wouldn't want to do it. Like I do enjoy, except when I'm stoned. I do not, flossing stone is awful. <laughs> You're getting in your gums. Oh, it's like, the yeah. worst feeling in the world. Cause I, I have a, a, insomnia. So I, I generally take a like five to 10 milligrams of an indica mm. gummy before bed. And I try to floss beforehand because then if I, if I get like a little roasty, like and sleeping, you get a, oh, that's bad. It's huh? the worst feeling in the world. Flossing and, 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 and weed are not friends. See, man, like I've, I've, it sucks. It sucks because I wish I could smoke. I wish I could smoke. It fucking drives me bananas, though. I'm doing the CBD thing, though. That's fucking great. You know, I, I get a little paranoid myself sometimes, but I feel that the, I'm not a spiritual person, but I, I, I like spiritual ideas, and I think that the, if you think about the, the shaman aspect of the, the THC spirit speaking to you, right. I feel that the paranoia that it awakens within you is is reminding you of weaknesses within your persona that need to be corrected, right? So what do you get paranoid about when you're stoned? Uh, for me, it's just – like I feel like when I'm out in public mainly, yeah. right? Like I feel like I'm looking at the world through a – this is going to sound really cheesy. Okay, nobody sure. hold it against me. But I feel I'm like I'm looking it at it you. from like an elevated place. You know what I mean? Like I've you know, transcended you, this realm and I've gone just maybe not even fully up there, but I've just moved one rung up the ladder to the yeah. next one. And I'm kind of looking down. I'm like, this is fucking freaky. Cause hmm. then I get into this weird space where I'm like, shit, dude, like who else knows? Do you know that this is what's happening? <laughs> Do you know? And then like when I'm interacting with people, I get that feeling of like, oh, fuck, this one knows, this one knows. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's yeah, bizarre. But see, I feel that, that that exists for you to overcome it because they don't. They might. They don't. They might. No. Take, the lady at Home Depot take, absolutely knew, dude. You got to bite it. You got to bite it and commit to it. They don't fucking know and it doesn't matter. It's it's a chat. Like, I, 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 I also like gummies for uh, socialization because it makes boring people a little less so. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> Suddenly everybody's entertaining. It's great. <laughs> See, that's why I prefer my uh, my whiskey, dude. I don't even need to drink a lot. Man. Just like one, two. You know. I've dialed back my drinking big time. Really? Yeah. I had, a, I mean, I had a legitimate, um, I wasn't a good, my relationship with alcohol has been spotty over the years. Let's just put it that way. Mm, and I tenuous. Yeah. And I, you know, let's just put it this way. If you would say to me right now, hey man, um, tell me a really inspiring story, right? None of those stories start with, well, I started drinking, <laughs> right? None of them. In fact, most of the terrible, embarrassing things that I've done in my life start with, well, you know, I started drinking. Um, it's not like I'm a person that can handle my booze for sure. But that said, I become very um, debaucherous, hmm. right? Uh, I'm definitely a lot of fun to hang out with. But it's it's just, I, it's unbecoming. I, sure. I, I just don't like the behavior of it. So I, I, I limit myself to three or four drinks a night. And I, I don't want to be, anytime I see those people that are just drunk, wasted, I, I just find it very unappealing. Is that that's something that I guess you learned over time, oh, maybe, right? Yeah, yeah, sadly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of people end up being that way, right? Like you, as you get older, you kind of like, mm, man, maybe this is not as cool as I think it is. And I think a lot of people. It's general with anything in life. I think people start identifying it as part of their personality. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, oh, I'm wild and crazy. I play hard. I work hard, whatever. All that right, basic bitch right. shit. Like I'm not me unless – I'm Unless I'm, yeah, I got mind. a cocktail yeah. and I got, you know, so I think, you know, I remember when I quit smoking, the hardest part of quitting smoking for me was the, you know, the thing, like the, having the, the ritual of, uh, being, okay. you know, yeah. wearing a leather jacket and I was mad. So I smoked. That's fucking stupid. But th that's why people smoke mostly. Speaking of fucking stupid, do you still have a motorcycle? No, I totaled that fucker. 
I, I was in a wheelchair for like I know, months. I oh, know, okay, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, like my brain would have jumped like, did he get another one? That's what I was thinking. Uh, you know, I think I, you had mentioned to me that you were looking at getting another one and you weren't going to let this stop you. And I do a lot of stupid shit, right? <laughs> and I like to push myself and get into interesting situations. Um, I've dialed that way the fuck back, by the way. Um, but there's something to be said for, have you ever had your body broken before? Thank God, no. This is probably a weird way to put it, but it's an incredibly sensual experience to feel yourself come back to life and your bones and your, I was told I was never going to walk properly again. Oh, it was that bad. It huh? was that bad. They said that my hips were so badly displaced that I would sort of always sort of be walking in a circle. And they were right. Like the, when I first started walking again, like walking straight was not like a thing, right? I had a, I had a very bad issue with mm -hmm. it. Um, and I didn't think that like my body wouldn't respond that it, there were, I, I still have some lingering phantom pain in my left cause my left foot was basically shattered. Uh, and there was one bad break called a Jones fracture. Most bones break in the center. A Jones fracture breaks at the side. So it's a very hard thing to set. Right. And every now and then I'll be sitting there. I'll be like, Oh, it just, it just hits. And this has been, you know, five, six years since this happened. So yeah, I was looking at some motorcycles again. And then I thought to myself, um, you know, sitting like it could have been so much fucking worse. Like yeah, I, I, I happened to rotate. I got, I got hit head on and my, la I didn't, you, you have all, you know, you good at motorcycle and you have all these ideas about what you're going to do in the emergency situation. All that goes out the fucking window. The second that car pulls into your lane and you're like, ah, that's your only reaction you have. So I jumped cause I, that's, I just thought I'd jump. Right. I couldn't hit the brakes, nothing. So I, my feet hit the handlebars and I flipped over the car oh, and it shit, just so happened dude. that the rotation that I landed on my feet. And so my waist down was just a disaster zone. Um, Could have landed on your head. If I landed, if I would have landed like face first or yeah. I, I'd have broken my neck, no doubt. Right. So I just happened to, and, and I, I don't know, I got a little bit of a death wish as it is. So it's not like I'm, I'm not all jarred by it or anything like that. Um, in fact, I, th I think it's, I don't know. But it, yeah, I just feel that the motorcycle, well, I'm, I'm good. I would, I would race. I would, cause I've always wanted to learn to, um, I almost bought a, a Ducati Pentagale. Mm. Um, and I wanted to learn to do, um, uh, racetrack stuff. Cause it's like professional. So I think Temecula has a track that you can rent. Is Temecula in California or am I crazy? Temecula sounds like it's in California. Yeah, sure, yeah, dude. I just made it up. It's in California. Isn't there, there's like, there's like a casino there. There's anyway. absolutely a Temecula in California. Though. So yeah, my, uh. That I just, I love <laughs> motorcycling. I, I, I adore Ducatis. Um, I've owned, I've, I've now owned and totaled three Ducati monsters. And I figure once you have totaled three motorcycles, somebody's telling you something. Yeah. Right. And not only that, it's like, you know, you put, you get them stock and I, I like to, I like to, I like to put carbon fiber on it, everything. I like to get the, the, um, uh, I mean, I guess they don't do the jet kits anymore, but, um, you know, make the bike sound great. I had it. It was matte. It was matte black. It was like a, it was it was like Batman's. I think motorcycle. I remember seeing that thing. Yeah, oh, such a badass yeah. bike. But then you know you get in this wreck, and they gave me four thousand dollars for damages. I'm like that paint job was four thousand dollars. They're like, eh, not anymore. It's not. It was general insurance with a little. Yeah, nothing. Nothing like buying car insurance from like a cartoon. General. <laughs> he looks really, really trustworthy, though. So I mean, I, not, I could see the general did would... not. He did not hook me. <laughs> so then I'm like, what am I going to do? Go buy. I mean, because Ducatis are expensive. Yeah, fuck yeah. So they are, you're going to go out buy, you know, Ducati, sink another seven, eight thousand, ten thousand dollars into it, and then I'm going to slaughter that motorcycle too. And maybe my each accident I got in was worse. And this one being the hey, dude, next time you don't get out of this, right? Um, but I, I healed myself through jujitsu and uh, snowboarding, interestingly enough. No shit. Yeah. Um, because I, what I'd realized, well, I didn't want to go to physical therapy because it, then I'd have to leave the house, obviously, uh, and go talk to people. I didn't <laughs> want to do that. So I thought, well, why don't we do this? I need to be put in a position where, like, I would feel the, the leg occasionally, like, do what I wanted it to do, right? And But most of the time, it, it, was, it was like this weird floppy leg. I'm like, God, this sucks. So, but it would, it would respond like a normal leg here and there. I'm like, what if I put myself in positions where I had to move it that way? And nothing, when you're snowboarding and you're coming down a mountain and you're going to hit a tree, if you don't move exactly the way you 
you want to quickly, you're toast, right? I ate shit up in Utah, dude. That was fun. Yeah, oh, I, I, I was in Santa Fe snowboarding and really fun. Like, I, I think it was one of those nine lives situations. Like, I think I sunny bottled myself. Well, get this, dude. So it's my first time fucking snowboarding. Yeah. They take me up onto the mountain, and it's towards the end of the season. So there, we were kind of shocked that there was even snow, right? But there was. It had snowed the previous day or whatever. But there was also a shitload of ice. So not only oh, for not my first – yeah, yeah, for my first time, dude, bunch of ice, you know what I mean? End of the season, all that shit's fucking slippery as shit. They take me up to the bunny slope. All right, I'm practicing. This is cool. All right, I got this. All right, all right, let's go over to uh, Green Diamond. Cool. Next step, right? Which one? Is that the middle or the hard one? That's it's the – blue, that's, green – is it green, blue, black? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, fuck it. Let's do the Green Diamond. All right, so they take us up to the Green Diamond. Uh, my buddies, I'm saying, t- took me up to the Green Diamond. And it was closed. And we're like, okay, what the fuck? You know what I mean? We couldn't take the path because there was just a bunch of fucking ice along it. Yeah, that's no fun. So we had to take the blue diamond. Uh Uh-huh. And... Some blue diamonds are not that simple. I don't give a fuck which blue diamond that was, bro. I wasn't ready for it. You know (laughs) what I mean? Like, it took me an hour to get down that mountain, dude. I bet. It was fucked. I flipped over like this a couple times, you know? You will do that. Yeah, but I, it's fun, man. I would totally do it again. Snowboarding was a oh, great so experience. Fun. I love it. It's one of my favorite pastimes to do. Um, Have you done skiing yet, or is it just yeah? Well, like... funny enough, I'm I'm an awful skier. Hmm. Uh, I I skied like in eighth or ninth grade. Uh, and it's it was completely just, different for people who don't know. Like, there's just something more organic about the snowboarding experience that I enjoy. Plus, I was a little bit of a punk when I was a kid, yeah. so it skateboarded. I mean, I was an awful skateboarder, but I was a proficient snowboarder. Um, so I just sort of kept it as something that I, I did. And, and there's when you get to the top of those mountains and you're just breathing that mountain air and looking out into the expanse. It's fucking awesome. Dude. It's really, a, it I'm really not is. much of a camper, you know. I, I'm not a nature guy. But maybe that's not true because when I get into situations like that and I just like breathe in that like pure, pure mountain air is, is really something spectacular. I wonder if you climbed the U.S. Bank building, if you could breathe in some clean air. Now you can. Did you see the article where they uh, the L.A. has, like, the cleanest air? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now? Holy shit, we have a picture my brother's friend took from the Burbank Mountains uh, facing west towards the beach. Uh-huh. You can see the fucking ocean. Oh, wow. That's right, because you live over that way. Huh. That that blew my mind, dude. When I saw it, I'm like, That's not, get the fuck out of here. I thought they were pulling my leg, you know what I mean? No, dude, you could absolutely see the fucking ocean from there. Huh. That's fantastic. It's great. We got a... What do they say? I swear some people just like, they love to dramatize. We got dolphins in the uh, the canals of Venice. You know what Holy I mean? Holy shit, like, did you see the video of the dolphins swimming in the illuminated water? No. Because the beaches are, they're doing that, uh, the algae that illuminates when yeah, it gets, yeah, yeah. that's happening on the coast, on California coast right now. Right now. Right now. <clears throat> what are we doing here? In Santa Monica, if I'm not mistaken, or Malibu. They have a video at night of a guy doing, he was flying his drone over and there's dolphins going, playing in it. Like, so this, it's it's dark and you just see like this dolphin shadow going, like it's it looks blue and then they come out. So they're, they're fucking with the algae as they dive in. And it's an excellent video. We need to get this TV situation set up in here, man. Yeah, we really do. Yeah. Maybe I'm just making it all up. Sound cool. <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> none of this is, none of this is real. <laughs> all right, we're at 90 minutes. All right, dude. I think Let, we got it. We let's it? do it, man. Let's roll. I think we got it too much. I'm there, sweating in is here there any, too, bro. Yeah, me too. I'm hot. Yeah. It's really. We're gonna have to get that fixed too, man. If I look, if I don't look, if I look sweaty on camera, then... I'll, I'll I'll make sure that I touch it up and post, dude. Is there anything else we need to cover? Did I do? No. Good... So why don't you? Uh, why did don't I do just... a good job of pimping this shit? Or what? you did an amazing job of pimping it, dude. Why don't you tell us uh, where we could find your book? Uh, well, you can find it. On, it's on Google Play, Amazon, and Barnes and Nobles. But I think that the uh, the Amazon print quality is pretty tasty, but it's also ebook or, um, <clears throat> excuse me, print. So you can find it on my website, brianjamesgage.com, Instagram, Brian James Gage, Twitter, Brian James Gage, Nosferatu Conspiracy, Instagram slash Nosferatu Conspiracy, uh, Nosferatu Conspiracy.com. And uh, I appreciate anybody who listened to this entire thing and, you know, supporting independent authors. We'll go ahead and throw all those links in the description below. Brian James Gage, it was a pleasure to have you on the show, man. Thanks, everybody. Peace. See you guys.